Today's sermon is titled, Jesus, Lord of All. Today, we will be taking a fresh look at the axiom of our Christian worldview. Now, if you think I threw a $500 word at you and you only have four bucks in your pocket, don't worry. I'm going to explain some things as I go along. But we're going to look at the axiom of our Christian worldview, and that is God's word and how it speaks truthfully and authoritatively to every part of life. Our resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ, has all authority in heaven and on earth. And as His disciples, we are charged to teach the nations to obey everything in His Word. Thus, in this message, we will explore what it means to make disciples of all nations and what it looks like to obey everything Jesus commanded in every sphere of society. And so those are two questions I want you to have on your mind throughout this message. You want to find out, how am I going to answer this? You may even want to write it down. Again, the question is, what does it mean to make disciples of all nations? And what does it look like to obey everything Jesus commanded in every sphere of society? Those are the two questions, and, and you've got to answer that for yourself, but for you and God. But we're going to walk through this together. If we could scroll down to the series definitions, I want to recap some of the terminology that we've been using and will be using today. The first thing I want you to see is that we all have a worldview. A worldview is how you see the world and give an explanation for everything you believe. Now, everyone point at your nose, okay? Everyone in this room has a nose, and everyone in this room has a worldview. You're like, I have a worldview? Yes, you do. You see the world, don't you? Depends on how you see the world. Now, we as Christians, we have a developed, fleshed out worldview. There's other religions that have a worldview. There's, there's even atheists, secular humanists. They have a worldview that, 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 you know, that's kind of codified in writing. But the vast majority of folks don't even realize they have a worldview. They're just kind of taking things as they come, and they don't realize that there are filters through which they look at the world. So it affects how they analyze things. It affects how they interpret the things that they see in the world. For us, we have a biblical worldview. We believe in seeing the world through the lens of God and His Word. So we have the 66 books of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We believe in a God who has decisively revealed Himself to mankind. Amen? And his word, his very word, is written in scripture. It has been inspired of God, and it has been preserved by God throughout the ages so that you and I could have a copy of it. You could even have it in an app on your phone. But this is the very word of God. This is what God revealed about himself. This is what God wants everyone on planet Earth to know. Amen. So this is our, our worldview. This is our axiom. And let's actually just go down to that triangle, please. I want to show you the worldview triangle. This is sort of a visual aid for everything I'm talking about. You see at the bottom is the axiom. Another word to make it easy is foundation. It's at the bottom. It is God's word for the Christian. Amen? And then we build from there. Based on our axiom, God's word, we have various presuppositions the Word of God gives the following six categories of knowledge. Knowledge pertaining to God, to creation, to humanity, to Jesus, to salvation, and judgment. Today's message is going to focus a lot on creation and humanity. I want you to see how the biblical Christian worldview applies to things going on in our world today, right here, right now, the stuff you see on the news, the stuff you read about on social media, the, the conversations that folks are having I want you to be able to analyze and think about those things through a Christian worldview. Moving up from there, we have propositions. God gave us revelation, but he also gave us a mind. And so we take the Bible and we study it to understand its meaning and then to make application to the world. So we come up with all kinds of propositions based on that. And then at the top, you have best guesses. Scientific and experiential claims. Now, some folks think that scientific claims should actually be on the bottom. Maybe you have that one friend who says, I believe in science. Maybe you are that friend. We love you. But the thing is, 
Science cannot be a foundation because science requires a foundation. Science requires logic. Science requires morality in order to truthfully interpret research. Uh, science requires the uniformity of nature that you could actually be able to look at the world and make sense of it. Darwinian evolution does not give you that. The Big Bang does not give you that. And if you, if you really want to press me on that, you could talk to me after service. But all the most consistent and honest atheists are also nihilist. A nihilist is someone who believes in nothingness, that nothing ultimately matters because we're just a, a, a big cosmic accident. It's a wonder we're even here or exist, but really life has no purpose in the end. And so science cannot be a foundation because it requires a foundation. And so up in this realm here, so for the Christian Science is just looking at God's stuff. Amen? It's exploring God's stuff. And for my video game friends, it's like finding the Easter eggs in God's creation. Let me give you an example here. Here's an iPhone. From the beginning of time, there have always been the resources available in the earth and the physical laws to make an iPhone. Right? But in the course of time... Through science, mankind was discovering the resources, how to harness them through physical laws to make things like iPhones and airplanes, so on and so forth. So for the Christian, based on that worldview, we can do science because we believe logic, morality, and the uniformity of nature. We believe in a brilliant, creative God who made a wonderful world of secrets to discover. Amen? So that is our worldview. And like I said, everyone has a worldview. Whether they think about it or not, they do. They have uh, presuppositions, but what I find most people lack is, is an axiom. As I've mentioned, atheists don't really have an axiom. They don't have any way to defend or justify the things they believe. An atheist can't explain why he lives a moral life, why he loves his mother, why he doesn't kill people, or, or you know, just do whatever he feels like doing at a given time. He has to act like a Christian in order to live a moral life. He has to act like a Christian to behave logically. He has to act like a Christian to trust in the uniformity of nature. Because atheism will not give him that. Only the Christian worldview will. Right. Having kind of laid that groundwork, let's look at our sermon text for, this, uh, for today. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. This is famously called the Great Commission. This is where Jesus is giving marching orders to his disciples. Jesus is God in the flesh. He came to earth, God became a man, lived a sinless life, died for sins, raised from the dead to defeat death, and now he's going to go back up to his father. But before he does that, he's giving instructions to his disciples Basically to say, here's how you're going to carry on my work. Here's how I want you to finish what I have started. And this is how it reads. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I have to stop here. I can't resist a good pun. I don't know who Shirley is, but she must be important because Jesus will always be with her to the end of the age. We're going to spend most of our time unpacking this text I want to look at some key phrases that, that Jesus used here. I'm going to omit some other ones. Now, every word of this is important, but I want to focus on some key phrases. So there's some things I'm not going to focus on. I'm not going to talk about baptism, for example. Uh, but you'll see what I really want you guys to get this morning. So the first phrase that Jesus uses is, All authority has been given to me. In order to understand this, you have to go back. Way back, back into time, back to the beginning. The book of Genesis tells us that at the beginning, God made mankind in his image and likeness, and he blessed them. He blessed the male and the female, Adam and Eve, 
and told them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So basically what God did is said, rule the earth for me. Fill the earth with my image. Amen? So God made man to rule the earth as his representatives. Amen? And we, we read on a couple chapters later, Genesis chapter 3, how it really all went to pot. Many of you know this story. You know how Eve was talking to the serpent, and the serpent made her doubt God. And she ate the forbidden fruit. The one thing she was not supposed to do, she did. It's like, gosh, you had one job, Eve. <laughs> but not only that, she's not the only one to blame because her husband, where was he? He was being a passive husband. He was not taking charge. And he just ate the fruit and didn't really do anything or question anything. And the moment they ate it, the moment they disobeyed God, the Bible says their eyes were open and, and they felt ashamed and they wanted to cover their nakedness. And what follows from there is the rest of human history, a tale of a lot of tragedy and suffering, a lot of rising and falling of nations. But you're seeing that mankind at that moment lost touch with God and lost authority to rule the earth. Now you do still see people in authority, but it's often an abused authority. It's often an incompetent authority. You ever, you ever have a job like, how did this guy get to be my manager? You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, we have authority, but it's messed up. Yeah, we have authority, but we give it to the devil. And so God's solution was that in the fullness of time, he would send his son. God the son became a man. Jesus Christ is the God man. He is fully God, fully man. All right, we learned that a few weeks ago. And he came as a man to live a sinless life, to die for sins, to raise from the dead, and conquer death. As a result, he has regained what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And he now has authority to fill the earth with disciples and subdue the nations for God the Father. He is seated at the highest place, given the name above all names, far above all rule and power, dominion and authority. Amen. He rules over the universe at the right hand of his father. And it says that he is ready to make his enemies like a footstool under his feet. He has authority to rule the nations. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. Jesus has all authority in heaven. It's hard for us to picture heaven, though the Bible gives us glimpses of an amazing scene that's truly mind-blowing, that really challenges your imagination. You guys, if you read Revelation, if you read, you know, where, where it talks about the throne room of God, it's an amazing scene. But what I want you to know about heaven is that in heaven there is perfect peace, order, and joy. And you know why that is? Because in heaven everyone obeys Jesus. Everyone loves Jesus. Jesus. Everyone worships Jesus. There's no sin or folly or rebellion to get in the way of that. And so you have perfect order, joy, and peace because Jesus' lordship is fully established in heaven. Now that's easy for us to believe because we don't live in heaven. On one hand, you could say, yeah, but I'm seated in heavenly places. True that. But where's your address? Somewhere in Chicago. Some 606 area code, right? You live here in Chicago. You live here on planet Earth. And Christians will say, yeah, he has authority in heaven, but when it comes to on Earth, uh, they're, a little, they're a little hesitant to make applications there. Does Jesus have authority in Chicago? Amen. Does he have authority in City Hall? Does he have authority in Washington, D.C.? Does he have authority in Hollywood? Does he have authority in colleges and universities? Yes, he does. He owns every square inch of planet Earth. It's all his. Now, you might ask, if Jesus really rules everything, then why is the world still messed up? It's because the nations are in rebellion. They don't want his lordship. They don't want to listen to him. Psalm 2 is a picture of what the world has always been like and will always be like until Christ returns. It says... Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, 
Let us break off their chains and throw off their shackles. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like the United States of America. That sounds like a nation that murders 60 million of its unborn children in the womb and it's government funded and every celebrity and every one of society's elites promotes and celebrates this wicked act of child sacrifice. You have a nation that's gnashing its teeth at God. We don't want your ways, God. We don't want your commands, God. We don't want anything to do with you. You know, in China, they're doubling down on the suppression of religious freedom. China is a communist country. They're ruled by the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party. And what they're actually trying to force people to, to do is give thanks and praise to the Communist Party of China before every meal. So just like a Christian would thank God for their food, now a communist has to thank the government for their food. As if it was the source of all things. You see nations shaking their fist at God. Using the authority God given them to actually deny God. But it goes on there in verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The nations, the people of this world are allowed to have their way, but it's not going to last. God is patient, but he's not slow. God is kind, but he's not weak. And he is giving the people of this earth the opportunity to repent and surrender to his lordship. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations as a testimony. You know what the gospel of the kingdom is? King Jesus conquered death. He's coming to take over. Here are your terms of surrender. God is using us. You and me to get them ready for his return. Pastor Joe preached from Revelation last week on God's divine judgment. It's literally a bloodbath, folks. So you have the opportunity to repent now. China has the opportunity to repent. United States has the opportunity to repent. Every wicked sinner that rejects Jesus' authority and places someone else's Lord has the opportunity to repent now, but it won't last forever. But when he does come, he will destroy the wicked with finality. And heaven will come to earth. Everyone will obey Jesus. Everyone will love Jesus. And there will be order, peace, and joy when the wicked are destroyed. So what do we do in light of this truth? The fact that Jesus has the title and deed to the entire universe. Therefore, go. Everyone say, go. go. Until his return... Jesus is extending his rule on earth by the preaching and teaching of his disciples. He is sending us out into the world with his authority. And he goes on. How do we go? How do we extend Jesus' rule? By making disciples of the nations. See, Jesus has a plan for world domination. But he's not a James Bond villain. He's not Thanos. Okay, it doesn't involve, you know, getting power stones or whatever. Here's Jesus' strategy. It is not by the sword or by political maneuvering. Jesus' strategy to change the world is by changing the hearts of sinful men and teaching them his righteous ways. It is a bottom-up approach that starts with individuals and households, but goes on to impact institutions, governments, and societies as more and more disciples are made. Think about this. Jesus of Nazareth. You know what Nazareth is? It's podunk. Okay? 
It's the middle of nowhere. Jesus is, was a nobody from nowhere in the world's eyes. Then he got 12 disciples. And when he left the scene, he had 120 disciples, but there's still a little band of people in the middle of nowhere. Do you know there's over 3 billion people in the world today who know the name of Jesus? Over half the world has been essentially Christianized and influenced by Jesus. Do you know that in Christian cultures, it is Christendom that, that allowed for the scientific revolution for the establishment of charities, of hospitals, of university, the elevation of women, women's suffrage, the abolition of slavery. Slavery had been practiced in every culture throughout human history. Even to this day, there's still slavery. But it is only in those Christianized nations where it was abolished. Get woke, folks. Jesus has been changing the world for the better. Don't believe the hype. So go make disciples of all nations. Imagine America, 300 million people. What if that's 300 million disciples? Do you think we're going to tolerate abortion? Do you think we're going to tolerate some of the filth that we parade and exalt in our culture? No, we're not. And we're going to be better for it. It's going to be, again, order, peace, joy, the kingdom of God coming to earth. And here's how we make disciples of all nations by teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. When someone becomes a disciple of Christ, they surrender fully to his lordship and seek to align their lives with his teaching. The extent of Jesus' teaching goes well beyond one's spiritual disciplines and personal morals. He is not merely concerned with what goes on in church services and prayer closets. Jesus' teachings contained in the whole Bible are binding in the home, the workplace, the community, and in society at large. Jesus has authority in the church, but also in the world, in government, education, media, etc. There is nothing truly secular and there is no neutral ground. Wherever Jesus is not acknowledged as Lord, you will find a competing worldview or, and something or someone else claiming lordship in that sphere. Thus, the Christian disciple cannot leave his or her worldview in the church. Obeying Jesus' teachings means that we seek to bring everything around us under the lordship of Jesus. Let me give you a great example of this. Joe B., will you stand up with Karina? This beautiful young couple, they're engaged. Do you guys have a wedding date down? Not yet? Karina wants you to be decisive, okay? Women want a decisive man who knows what he wants and when he wants it anyway. So, so let's, let's take them as an example of how obedience to Jesus it, it results in spreading of his lordship. So let's say, you know, you guys are keeping it holy, right? Amen. You're obeying Jesus' teaching. And I had no doubt in my mind they were. I know them very well. They're obeying Jesus' teaching regarding sexuality, right? And then they get married, right? Now, Joby, do you plan to obey the teaching of Jesus that says, love your wife as Christ loved the church and lay your life down for her? Yes. Amen. And Karina, do you plan to obey the teaching of Jesus that says to submit to your husband as Christ does the church? Yes. Amen. And when you have children, will you keep the command of Jesus to uh, raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and not exasperate them? Amen. Amen. And Lord willing, as they grow up, they'll keep the command of Jesus to honor your father and mother. What you will have in the Bonilla home is a slice of heaven. I'm not just being sentimental here. Because in the Bonilla home, everyone obeys Jesus. Everyone worships Jesus. Everyone loves Jesus. Everyone serves Jesus. And to the extent that they love, obey, and serve Jesus is to the extent they have order, joy, and peace. We know it can be a dark and scary world, but in the Bonilla home, it'll be a refuge. It'll be a place of safety and blessing. And many of us know firsthand that when you have households that are not in obedience to Christ, how much heartbreak, how much danger that we put ourselves and our loved ones into. Thank you guys for standing up. Now, we believe that the Christian home should be under the lordship of Christ. How about the Christian lawmaker? When they go to Capitol Hill, should they keep their worldview at home? 
the atheist lawmaker, they don't keep their worldview at home, do they? No, they, they allow their worldview to di- dictate what kind of laws they want to promote, what kind of laws they vote for and pass, right? Does Jesus have authority in Capitol Hill? Amen. Should the lawmaker, should they be obeying Jesus' teaching at Capitol Hill? Amen. So I think we need to have that in mind because many Christians are passive. They want to keep their worldview in home, in their heart. And we could talk about it in services and gatherings like this. But when it gets out there, uh, no, that's none of my business. I'm not trying to impose my beliefs on others. You hear many uh, politicians who are essentially pro-choice. They are for abortion. They vote, they vote for abortion. They support abortion every chance they get. And, but many of them will talk out of two sides of their mouth and say, but I'm personally pro-life. What a crock. Right? If you really believed in pro-life, you would do anything you could, anything in your power, especially as a lawmaker, to stop the murder of babies. You would do it. And, and, and so, so that's, that's the trouble there. You're seeing that many Christians are actually not living out their worldview in the public square. They're not doing it. The Christian lawmaker, the Christian filmmaker, whatever you do, they have this hesitancy to actually talk about Jesus and, and promote Jesus' teachings in public life. I want to make some points of application here. I think there's honestly a lack of knowledge and a lack of courage among many Christians. Therefore, the first point of application is to know your axiom. What is our axiom? The Word of God. Know your axiom. Today, many Christians find themselves woefully unprepared to make disciples and impact the world because they don't know their faith well enough. A recent major survey of American evangelicals shows how many professing Christians are either not sure about or flat flat out disagree with the core doctrines of the Bible. How can anyone teach others to obey what they themselves are not sure of or aren't in agreement with? The result is that Christians cannot defend their views or properly analyze anything from a biblical perspective. They have no defense when their faith is attacked, and they must allow the world to direct the narrative on life's most important issues simply because they don't know what the Bible says about them. We as disciples must become deeply familiar with our axiom, the Bible. We should get to know its story, its core teachings, its tough text, how it was written, and how it was passed on to us. Most importantly, we must be confident that it is the very Word of God and speaks truth to every part of life. I referenced a recent major survey of American evangelicals. Every two years, Ligonier Ministries does an expansive uh, research study on the views of American Christians. And so one of the ways they'll, they'll conduct a survey is they'll put out various statements and you'll say, agree, disagree, or not sure. And I'm going to give you a little sampling here of some of these statements and how, the, and how the people fared. Statement number 11, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Scroll down a bit. Everyone see that? The finding, 52% of evangelicals agree. Y'all know, y'all know the Bible, right? Does, does it teach that people are good by nature? It teaches that we're sinners, that we're fallen creatures in need of salvation. Over half of Christians in this nation, professing Christians actually believe the opposite is true. They disagree with the Bible. Let's, let's look at another one. There we go. God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The most recent finding was that 51% agree with this statement. Again, a little more than half agree. Listen, folks, Jesus was a Jew. His apostles were Jews, Okay. But we just read the Great Commission, Matthew 28. He's basically telling them, hey, go out into all the world and tell everyone to worship me. That included the Jewish people. The gospel was first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And Muslims came along centuries later. But no matter where you were, whether you were a Jew, whether you were pagan, whether you didn't believe in anything, the the idea is we go out in the world and say, hey, you got to worship Jesus now. you got to serve Jesus now. That smashes religious pluralism. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. But 51% of evangelicals disagree with that statement. Let's, let's continue on. All right. This is a more heartening statistic. God counts a person as righteous 
not because of one's works, but only because of one's faith in Christ Jesus. 91% uh, agree with this, so that's a good thing. Let's keep going. All right. This is a statement regarding the Trinity. There is one true God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 97% agree with that, which is a good thing, but I can't help but think they're just kind of nodding their head like, gotcha. Ask them to explain the Trinity, see how, how real it gets. You know what I'm saying? Let's, let's, let's look at the next one. Okay, here we go. Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Someone tell me what's wrong with that statement. He's create, Yeah, he's not created, right? He's not a created being. That's what Jehovah Witnesses believe. That's an ancient heresy called Arianism. Listen, there's a world of difference between saying Jesus is a created being and Jesus is God. You guys, we will wrap your mind around that. That's a big deal, all right? So what you're finding is that a lot of Christians don't believe in Christianity. Now, somebody might be saying to that, how dare you judge someone's spiritual walk? And it's not for you to decide who, who's a Christian and who's not. They don't have to pass your doctrinal test. Well, let's say you were an animal rights activist, okay? You were a member of PETA. And there was research done of animal rights activists in America. And we found out that 78% of them agree with clubbing baby seals and drinking their blood. See, you can't claim to be something and then believe something that's utterly contrary or live a way that's utterly contrary. Yet people treat Jesus like that all the time. Listen, Christianity isn't what you say it is. It isn't what I say it is. It isn't what the culture says it is. Christianity is the truth of Jesus Christ revealed to the world and he wants everyone to know about it. Amen? So we need to have Christians who believe in Christianity, who know their Bibles. And sadly, many don't. Imagine if you were talking with your coworker at lunch, and they just slammed you with a tough Bible question. They ask you, hey, you ever read Numbers 31? Numbers 31? No. Well, it's, it's, it's the passage where God tells Moses to kill all the Midianites and leave the virgins. You ever read that? And then what proceeds to happen is you get spanked and you walk away licking your wounds and maybe some folks of weaker faith would begin to doubt God because an atheist told them what Numbers says before their pastor did. Come on, folks. You have Christians, they haven't read the Bible. They read little parts of the Bible. They read little fortune cookie proof texts. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11, which is wonderful. But you know what I'm saying? All these verses, John 3, 16, Romans 8, 28. And, and you get your little devotional and you read it every day. And you hear a little sermon to help you cope every week. And you barely skim the surface. You don't know your axiom. And you might not even believe your axiom if you found out what it really said. Scary stuff. Lastly, and I won't get too much into this, but there has to be a great confidence that the Bible is the Word of God and speaks truth to every part of our lives. There is a link in the notes to what is called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. So in this city in 1978, Christian scholars and leaders got together to form a comprehensive statement about, about the Bible and what they believe. And the key word there is inerrancy. If God wrote a book, it better be error-free. Amen? But you have many Christians in many cemeteries, <clears throat> seminaries, seminaries that are at home with the idea that the Bible could be full of errors, that many parts are just fables that are not historically accurate. There's folks at home with that. There's folks in, who are pastors who are okay with with even the miracles of the Bible saying it may or may not have happened, you know, what's important is that we just have hope or something, you know, and they try to minimize it because they really don't want the offense of everything the Bible teaches. Folks, we need to hold that the Bible is the word of God because if God didn't speak, what are we doing here? We just, we just have another opinion in a world full of worthless opinions. 
We believe that God spoke. That's what we're going out to the ends of the earth for. That's what we'll lay down our lives for. Not man's opinion, not man's thoughts about God, not man's interpretations, not a book that's like 50% true and it says some good things, but there's some other stuff that it's kind of eh. No, this is the word of God. It's authoritative. It's inerrant. It's inspired. It's trustworthy. Everything it says is true. And we need to bank our lives on it. The next thing, next point of application is this. Live in holiness and in excellence. Did you know that holiness and excellence go hand in hand? Every disciple should seek to live pure and holy lives, not only for the sake of their relationship with God, but to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive to outsiders. And that's a quote from Titus chapter 2. God's Word not only teaches us good morals, but also wisdom. Y'all ever read the book of Proverbs? There's a lot of wisdom, practical wisdom on how to be, be better, you know? It's not a self-help book, but man, it'll help yourself a lot. Amen? If you read it. A proverb a day keeps the stupid away. You know, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. Most months of the year have 31 days. You read a chapter a day, see, see how, it, how it does you, you know? But it, it's not only about what you don't do. Well, I'm a Christian now, so I don't smoke and cuss. No, it's a Christ, I'm a Christian now, and so now I, I'm living life a whole new way, and it's the most excellent way. So it gives us wisdom how to be people smart, and how to excel in all our endeavors. One of my favorite examples of this was Daniel. Back at it with the vans. Some of you remember that. <laughs> so you have Daniel. So if you don't know, uh, ask your kids. Um, so you have Daniel. He was a godly Jewish man, young man living in Babylon, which is the epitome of a corrupt cruel, pagan culture. And he's working in the palace of King Nebuchadnezzar. And you see that nowhere does Daniel ever compromise his beliefs to get ahead. He doesn't engage in their dark arts, their occultism. He doesn't worship their false gods. He doesn't engage in their immorality. He didn't even eat the same food as them. He's like, is that kosher? No? Okay. He don't even eat the same food. Stands out. In Daniel 6, you guys know the story, Daniel in the lion's den. You know why he was in the lion's den? The king said, for 30 days, everyone has to pray to me. You can't pray to anyone else but me. You think Daniel prayed to that, to that joker? No, he didn't. Kept praying to his God as he'd always done. Didn't stop. That's why they threw him there. Nevertheless, even though he stood out like a sore thumb, he stood out in all the best ways. He had a reputation for having every matter of wisdom and understanding ten times that of all his co-workers. Holiness and excellence go hand in hand. Don't get a martyr syndrome here saying, well, I'm a Christian and they don't, they don't welcome my point of view. Because and, and, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to compromise, okay, you're going to say, well, I, if I want to get ahead in my career or whatever, i got to compromise because they they, my Christian ethics aren't going to work here. Or you're going to be cowardly. Well, I'm not going to talk about Jesus here. You, th that was not the case with Daniel. He didn't compromise and he wasn't a coward and he excelled and he succeeded. Now, I, 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 I should also acknowledge that in places like Pakistan, you can't get really good jobs. You can't be a doctor or an engineer because, as a, if you're a Christian, that is, because they will... Uh, keep you from those sorts of things. But while we're still in God blessed America, let's get it, baby. Let's get it. Let's be excellent. Let's thrive. Let's be influencers. Daniel had an outstanding reputation, and we see how he used his spiritual gifts in the workplace. And there's even, there's even a place where King Nebuchadnezzar, that old pagan king, gives glory to Daniel's God. So as Daniel's influence increased, God's influence increased. How about that? Live in holiness and excellence. Let's look at this last point here. It is be bold. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. By the way, that's the biblical definition of jogging, 
fleeing though no one pursues. <laughs> Disciples of Christ should be the boldest and most articulate about what they believe in. When asked about the hope in Christ, we must be ready to give an answer with gentleness and respect. When wickedness and error are being promoted, we must boldly correct it with God's truth. Many Christians are afraid of turning people off in this way because they mistake boldness for pushiness and arrogance. But God will not use cowardice and vagueness, confusion to draw people to himself. That may win some goats. That may attract some people who want their ears itched. That may attract people who are extremely concerned that they never get offended about anything. That may attract people who think it's all about them, but that won't make disciples. There's real disciples out there, and, they, and, and they're crying out for something real. And they're going to be attracted to courage and passion. People who not only know what they believe, but they show what they believe. You know, I facepalm every time I see a big name pastor appear on a talk show. And they're asked rather straightforward questions to which they politic. They, give, they hem and haw. They give very indirect answers. So there was one pastor from New York on the Katie Couric show. She asked him plainly, does your church have a position on homosexuality? And he says, well, we have a position on love. Well, that's a yes or no question. You would have failed that test. We have a position on love. And then as she's trying to get him to just be real. Yeah, well, we would have to have, you know, conversations. And, we, you know, it's, it's important we don't judge people's walk and all that stuff. Does anything but answer the question. Great politician. Poor preacher. And because he's not saying what the Bible says on that issue, Katie Couric gets to say what she says unchallenged. The gals on The View get to say what they say unchallenged. Jimmy Kimmel and these late night guys get to say what they say unchallenged and appear right in the eyes of America. Because we've forsaken our foundation. And, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have an answer for it. Now, as much as we can lament how, you know, given the opportunity, you know, many pastors blow it and all that stuff. What about you? This Thursday's Thanksgiving. Are you ready to make it awkward for Jesus? Hey, Grandma. If you died today, would you go to heaven or hell? Abuelita, you know that rosary won't save you. We're not going to win folks that way. We, you know, we can offend people also, but we can also win people. And, and we need to be bold. We need to be able to speak up. Let us all stand. I just want to close out with this statement here. We've been talking about Jesus having authority in heaven and on earth. And, and let's have our, uh, our prayer workers start to come up as well. Thank you. Jesus having authority in heaven and on earth. We've been talking about heaven being this perfect, beautiful, serene, peaceful place. But in contrast, the earth is a, it's a place of pain and hardship and tragedy, is it not? Do we not see it all the time? Many of us have experienced tragic things, evil things, injustice very close to home. When we are making disciples of all nations... We are partnering with God to answer the Lord's prayer that he said in Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, 
Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are you doing to make the earth around you a little more like heaven? Your home, your workplace, your commute. What are you doing? Well, let's bless the Lord.